director. He is not part of the film school generation, as so many of these people are. He came through television, and he wasn't part of live television either, but he directed some filmed television back in the 1950s and 1960s, westerns and things like that. And he is often called revisionist, and he's going to take uh, well-known genres like war movies and romances and detective movies and look at them in a different way, a whole revised, cockeyed sort of a way. And so starting off with M.A.S.H., <coughs> war movie, uh, big ensemble cast. Altman wasn't a big fan of uh, stars and things like that. He liked big casts. A lot of his movies have great big casts. And also one of his trademarks is layered sound. And we will hear that through some of the selections I have for us. He liked the idea of miking lots of people up and letting them do crosstalk. He thought it sounded more uh, natural. And so there's a little bit of that running through a lot of his films as well. This is the original poster for the film. I love it. It's, it's just great. It really does the whole thing. It's kind of a little sexy there. Uh, and uh, there's war going on with the helmet, and there's a peace sign. Uh, so it really is a wonderful, a wonderful poster logo. Um, and it was a big hit when it came out. So Altman had a pretty good decade in the 1970s, MASH, and I will explain the whole career for Vietnam in a second. Also, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, a revisionist Western, Brewster McCloud, kind of a fantasy, uh, The Long, Long Goodbye, a definitely, uh, definitely a uh, revisionist detective movie, and Nashville, a movie with great big cast. Skipping ahead, uh, he was still working uh, in the 90s and into the new millennium. Uh, Altman was a little bit older than some of these film school guys like Scorsese and Spielberg. Uh, like I said, he'd been directing uh, television in the 1950s. So he was maybe 10 or 15 years older than a lot, a lot of these young film school uh, guys. So MASH, Korea, uh, or Korea for Vietnam. Uh, MASH is set in the Korean War, 19, uh, about 1951, uh, but it has this attitude of anti-establishment. Uh, Altman and the, uh, and the writer, the screenwriter, and the author of the original book are going to poke fun at the military. They're going to poke fun at religion. They're going to poke fun at sports, and who knows what else. Uh, and so that really seemed in uh, that really seemed in touch with the Vietnam War era. A lot of anti-war uh, 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 people uh, coming out of the 1960s with uh, with the rock music and long hair and um, uh, drugs and all that kind of stuff. And so even though Mash was set in Korea of the 1950s. It has a real 1960s feel about it. And uh, the Korean War was similar to the Vietnam, the Vietnam uh, War in that there was a North and a South, a communist uh, North fighting a supposedly capitalist South. So they had, the, they had all that in common. They were also set in Asia, although Korea is way, way north and Vietnam's way, way in the south uh, in the tropics. But it was enough, of, uh, enough similarities that when it came out in 1970, it really seemed like an anti-Vietnam War kind of a movie. Technically, it's not a Vietnam War movie, but it really, to a lot of people, seemed like a Vietnam War movie. So it's, it's kind of... Kind of is and kind of isn't. And uh, so I've got some nice uh, selections for you. Uh, again, while you're going through this class, you're welcome to pause the PowerPoint slide narration and go check out some of the film clips that I have lined up for you and then come back to this 
if you want to, that might be a good way to do it. That's kind of the way it would be done in class uh, that I would talk about uh, talk about films, show a PowerPoint slide, and then uh, drop in a DVD. Usually I would drop in a DVD so I could show the parts that I want to show rather than the parts that are already there on YouTube. Um, and then we'd go back to then we'd go back to the uh, uh, PowerPoint slide. So that might be a way to go. Another 1970s revisionist type director, Hal Ashby. And he had really quite a good decade. Um, a number of these directors had pretty good decades. When we get to, when we get to uh, Francis Coppola, he had a, also a pretty good decade as well. Uh, but Hal Ashby, boy, his films really also feel like the 1970s to me. They've just really got that feeling and that attitude, uh, much, like, much like MASH, I guess. So we're going to start with Harold and Maude. Uh, and it is a love story. It's definitely a revisionist love story. Maude is uh, just shy of 80. Harold is somewhere around 20, 21, something like that. So a 55, 60 year age difference, but it really is a uh, romance. Hal had a really also amazing decade. As I mentioned, Harold and Maude, he did The Last Detail with Jack Nicholson. He did Shampoo. Uh, coming home and being there, and we will look at some clips of uh, being there, and I'm not sure what else, but you are always encouraged to dig around in YouTube and look at clips and stuff from uh, from uh, some directors and films and things like that, and and dig around. Uh, Harold and Maude, uh, as you will see, um, is uh, as a very quirky, uh, Maude has kind of a secret. I don't want to spoil that. Uh, her backstory, I won't say secret, but she has a backstory that's very, very interesting. Harold, uh, for one reason or another, is obsessed with death, and he stages rather elaborate suicides, um, partly as an attention-getting gesture, and there's probably some other underlying stuff there, too. Uh, and it's a very funny movie. Some of the dates and things that Harold goes on are, are really quite hilarious. Um, there's kind of a uh, kind of a role reversal going on here because Harold is uh, quite well off. Uh, he seems a little buttoned down. He seems uh, kind of uh, uptight, as uh, the, the word was back in the back in the 60s and 70s. Maud comes across kind of as a hippie chick. Uh, she wants to free the canaries from their cages and uh, pose nude for ice sculptures and all sorts of uh, and uh, herbal teas and this and that and the other. So it's definitely got a uh, sort of an age reversal. I, I won't say role reversal, maybe age reversals kind of the thing. Harold seems a lot more, uh, at, at least at the start of the movie, of course, a lot more buttoned up or buttoned down and, um, and neurotic for sure. Being there, very interesting film uh, with Peter Sellers. And uh, when you look at the trailer, um, remember that the marketing department of the studio is trying to sell something that's a pretty difficult sell. And that's one of the things that's running through a lot of these films that I'll be talking about in class, all the way up to Christopher Nolan. Uh, movies like Inception, things like that, um, and uh, you know how can a marketing department from a Hollywood movie studio sell something like that in just a couple of minutes with maybe a 30 second or one minute TV commercial or a two or three minute trailer. Uh, these are difficult movies to sell in a very short period of time. And uh, so, even today, we have lots of movies that are uh, not part of franchises. They're not number three or five or seven or something like that. They're a hard sell and sometimes maybe put ourselves in the, the shoes of the marketing department and think, how are we going to sell 
uh, that movie. Uh, Being There is about a man, played by Peter Sellers, wonderful Peter Sellers. We met him in Dr. Strange Love. And he is uh, raised in a big estate. And we don't know much. It's almost like a fairy tale, really. He's raised on a big estate. We don't know anything about his parents. There's a rich man uh, that, uh, it's a big walled estate. And a rich man seems to be at the head of uh, this. It's, it's walled in and our, uh, our uh, protagonist chants the gardener uh, and through misunderstandings will be Chauncey Gardner. Um, the, uh, the old man uh, uh, dies and so our uh, protagonist, Chance, is going to be left to go out into the world to fend for himself. They're going to uh, give him... He's been fed. There are, there are maids and butlers and things and he's been fed. But he works in the garden and watches TV. And that's about all he knows about life. He hasn't been outside the walls of the estate, uh, perhaps ever, or certainly since he's been an infant. So uh, out he goes into the world, and being a white man, okay, and that point is made, and dressed quite nicely, he's going to be mistaken for an important person, and he's going to be taken in and become Chauncey Gardner, and he really only knows uh, television and gardening. And when he speaks uh, uh, literally about uh, as long as the roots are not severed in the garden, the important people around him, soon enough it's actually the president, are thinking he's talking about perhaps the economy or something like that, uh, the roots of the economy or the roots of the republic. And Chance, the gardener, is talking literally about gardening. So uh, anyway, it's a very funny movie, um, and uh, and Harold and Maude and uh, a number of the other uh, number of the other films from Hal Ashby are really fantastic. I always enjoy I always enjoy showing Hal Ashby clips. Okay, next up we are back to Stanley Kubrick, and we have talked about Kubrick a couple of times already. Going back to genre films. And we were talking about horror films and how The Shining was a revisionist horror film. Uh, we also talked about Dr. Strangelove, and we talked about 2001, and we have A Clockwork Orange right now, and uh, later on we still have Full Metal Jacket, so we're going to spend a chunk of time on Stanley Kubrick. Uh, Clockwork Orange from 1971 was... Uh, a pretty out there movie. This is coming after 2001. A big, giant, very expensive movie. This one was not so expensive, uh, but very controversial. 2001 was actually kind of controversial too. So Clockwork Orange was uh, very controversial, mostly for sex and violence. Uh, it was X-rated originally. Uh, I think it's been down uh, graded or downrated to R uh, lately. But um, uh, ultra violence uh, for sure. Uh, so uh, enjoy. In, I, maybe I shouldn't say enjoy uh, the clips from the film. I should probably give you a. Um, I should probably alert you that it's uh, rough stuff. Uh, there is uh, violence, um, um, gangs fighting. Uh, rapes. It's not graphic, exactly. It's not graphic. It's, it's uh, you know, you're not going to see uh, that much, but a lot of it's implied, but it's very hard uh, stuff to stomach. So um, if that's not your thing, then uh, you have been, uh, you have been warned. Um, just be careful. Uh, some of the Clockwork Orange stuff, it is, uh, it is quite striking. On the surface, it's about young gangs uh, creating havoc, but underneath it's really about free will. And they are young. In the book, I think Alex is only 15 or 16. Uh, Malcolm McDowell plays Alex. He uh, uh, does a fantastic job. Clearly he's older than 15 or 16, but he is playing someone who's about high school age, uh, which makes it even more uh, horrific, I think. 
and uh, so it has lots of bright colors and sped up and slow-mo and electronic music and all sorts of stuff to make it look kind of fun. Um, but the subject matter is really pretty dark when you think about these, these people, you know, uh, beating people up and, and, and stealing and raping and all that awful stuff. And Alex is the protagonist. We don't really have anybody else in this movie than Alex, who's really an awful, reprehensible person. And that's kind of what is happening in the 1970s. We keep getting over and over again some people who are really uh, pretty awful. Even Michael Corleone from The Godfather, uh, he's, uh, you know, he's in the mob. And they they kill and, and steal and do all sorts of uh, awful things, and he's kind of the hero. Uh, so, again, that's part of a continuing theme of films from the 1970s. And Alex is the alpha dog in his gang, uh, and he uh, is going to overstep his role. And uh, the other gang members are going to set him up. Uh, it is done with a first-person voiceover from Alex, and he is going to, uh, they're going to do their, their violence to very stylized sets and costumes and uh, early electronic music as well. Uh, a lot of Beethoven running through it. That's one of Alex's true loves. He just loves Beethoven and the glorious Ninth Symphony. So we're kind of torn here. He, that seems fairly civilized, really, to be a classical music lover, especially somebody so young. And he is going to speak this new uh, gang speak, lots of new words, uh, droogs and vidi and uh, gulliver and uh, words like that. Generally, the context of their use, you can tell what, uh, what they mean. Uh, he's going to, uh, you know, vidi this obviously uh, will mean to see, almost like video, you know, vidi this. Um, and uh, a lot of the other new words, you can usually figure it out by the context of the way they're being, they're being used. Uh, the, the Gulliver, I think, is his head and things like that. So um, there probably are a dozen or more new words, but generally most viewers can figure out what they're talking about. So Alex is going to be uh, set up to be captured by the police, and he's going to go off to prison for manslaughter, manslaughter, uh, not murder, but manslaughter, and he's going to be given the opportunity to partake in a new treatment, and the new treatment is the Ludovico technique. Basically, it's a kind of conditioning, and he is going to be forced to watch violent movies, and normally he would love that sort of thing. He would love to watch movies about war and, and rape and killing and fighting and blood and all that stuff. He would love that kind of stuff, but he's going to be given drugs that make him feel sick or ill or, or wanting to vomit, uh, a, a, drowning, a drowning feeling, and so he's going to be conditioned that when he thinks of violence, he won't even be able to act on his feelings. He will be down on his hands and knees and retching. So his free will will be taken away. Now, he doesn't have the free will to fight and, and uh, hurt and rape, and that's definitely a good thing. But on the other hand, he doesn't have free will. And generally, we don't think that that's a very good thing. So Kubrick and the author have put us kind of right in the middle of, of wanting an awful person like, uh, like Alex to be off the streets and not be doing all of his violent activities and things like that. But we'd like to think that uh, he sees the light and that he doesn't want to do that because he knows that it's wrong. Uh, he still doesn't know that it's wrong. He just can't do it. He just can't act on his impulses. And so that's a really difficult question that we have uh, for society. We know in our prison system that there are lots of people that are uh, in prison 
uh, they are doing their time. There's a, there's a set penalty, five years or seven years or ten years for whatever they have done. And when they get out, very likely they are going to need to commit those crimes again, possibly uh, uh, pile, possibly child molesters and things like that. For uh, child molestation, it is not life in prison. Okay, the penalty is not life in prison. It might be 10 or 15 or 20 years, but it's not life in prison. And when these child molesters get out of prison, they are sick and they are going to be compelled often to commit crimes again. And so in society, that puts us in a really difficult position, knowing that someone has paid their debt to society, they are going to come out into the world and very, very likely commit the same crimes again. A lot of times it's not uh, as awful and horrific as uh, child molesters. It might just be uh, drugs or stealing or something like that. But people very uh, often will get out of prison and go back to the same life of crime that they knew before they went in. And as a society, we have to somehow figure out what, what to do and how to do it. Um, and so uh, uh, Kubrick and uh, the author, Anthony Burgess, don't really have uh, solutions or answers. It's presenting this question for us to think about. Free will and how far do we want to go uh, in our society. So we've talked a lot about uh, Kubrick. Uh, like I said, we've, we've talked about some of these other uh, classes. This is our uh, third or fourth Kubrick film. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a wonderful exhibit at the County Museum, a whole floor of uh, the museum, at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, uh, was devoted to Kubrick. And I went there and I took some pictures, so I thought I'd just zip through those. And uh, you can check these out. Uh, some of the posters... There's Lolita and some foreign language versions of some of the other films uh, that he's done. Uh, there's Clockwork Orange and, uh, and some other stuff. I think this is Clockwork Orange as well. Uh, 2001, Barry Lyndon, uh, great stuff. And uh, exhibit, uh, those chairs, those gorgeous uh, chairs were from 2001. There's the typewriter. From The Shining, All Work and No Play, Makes Jack a Dull Boy. The Maze from The Shining. I don't think we saw that scene, but uh, it's a key role in the it's a key role in the movie, that's for sure. And uh, in the movie there's a there's a real maze and then there's a giant tabletop maze. And that's the one from the movie. Uh, we also looked at Dr. Strangelove. There is the survival kit contents pack uh, with uh, all those wonderful pills and things and the Russian phrase book, phrase book and Holy Bible and all that uh, stuff. That is the, the wheel for uh, in uh, 2001 when one of the uh, astronauts goes jogging. He, he appears... To, he appears to be jogging up the wall and down and around. In reality, he's always at the bottom and the whole thing is spinning. But due to the camera placement and so on, it looks like he's running up the walls and down in that, in that uh, centrifugal force. There's the wonderful design of the helmet from 2001. And uh, let's see, oops, we already saw that. And uh, from Clockwork Orange, the Corova milk bar. Okay, so uh, we'll leave Kubrick for a little while, and by 1972, we have another American classic, The Godfather, from Francis Ford Coppola, as he was called back then, and he is very definitely part of the film school generation. He's kind of the godfather, if you will, of the film school generation. He was a couple of years older than, than uh, Spielberg and Scorsese and Lucas and some of those people. And so he was out of film school by about 1965 or 66. He was uh, making movies 
not big ones, not big budget movies, but he has, was making a number of movies. I think this is his fifth or sixth movie, The Godfather. And so when some of these young film school guys got out of college and were hoping to get some of their ideas made, Coppola had befriended uh, George Lucas and produced uh, a couple of his very first films, um, uh, THX 1138 and American Graffiti, and studios don't usually like to take a chance on young, uh, fresh filmmakers, but if there's an experienced person that's there to make sure everything runs smoothly, a lot of times that's, uh, uh, that's helpful, right? That's a, that's a good thing, and they will, they will take a chance. So uh, Coppola, definitely part of the full film school generation, helping out a number of the other directors. Godfather, 1972, uh, an all-time classic, and over the years, the Godfather has slowly risen. Remember, it was just a gangster movie, uh, but it has slowly risen in esteem, and a lot of polls have it number two to um, Citizen Kane, um, and some might be a little higher, a little lower. Uh, a lot of those best of films, uh, the, you know, the, the movies all change places. 2001's on there, and uh, Sunset Boulevard's on there, and Lawrence of Arabia's up there, and Casablanca is up there, and so on, and they all change, change places and so on, but the, the usual 10 or 15 films are up there in one order or another. And so over the years, from 1972, The Godfather has gone up and up and up, and in one of the most recent polls, <coughs> it came in number two. So, uh, excellent. A lot of times people uh, put Godfather Part 1 and Godfather Part 2 as one movie. I'm not quite there. I don't quite put that as one movie. They were made a couple years apart um, and were never planned to be one movie. I would put The Lord of the Rings as one movie because they were always planned to be one movie. They were shot all together at the same time, and we'll talk about that later and then edited, and the special effects were done separately. So that so Lord of the Rings was always planned as one movie, and so was The Hobbit. But The, the Godfather and Godfather Part Two weren't really planned as one movie, but uh, a lot of uh, critics and pollsters uh, like, to, like to call The Godfather uh, saga um, as one movie and put it up there very high in the rankings. So uh, about The Godfather, Marlon Brando from way back with, uh, uh, from the 1950s and um, On the Waterfront and The Wild One and some fantastic, mo fantastic movies like that and uh, held in very high esteem. He won the Oscar for this movie, but it was a little bit of a long shot. Uh, Brando was getting to be a little bit eccentric. Sometimes that happens when you're a big star uh, and, uh, and are paid lots and lots of money and he, he bought an island after, after shooting Mutiny on the Bounty out there in, the, in Tahiti and was not reliable uh, getting to the set and memorizing his lines and all that kind of stuff. And so some of the studio executives were not really sure that Brando was right for the part. But Coppola really, truly believed in him. Uh, and uh, his, his faith in Brando uh, came through. Uh, he, he won the award and did a fantastic job. He was only in his 40s when he made the movie, so they had to uh, do some uh, makeup and stuff. They put some stuff under here to give him a little bit of the jowls and so on, and of course, grade his hair and a few other things. But he was a, a, a pretty young and vibrant, uh, forty-something-year-old uh, when he made when he made the film. Um, and uh, Al Pacino was very young. He'd done a little bit of Broadway and a couple of very small movies. Uh, not much of a star. The studio, Paramount, really wanted. Uh, bigger stars, but they probably wouldn't have been right for the part. Uh, the the main family, the Corleone family, are Sicilians, um, and you you can almost imagine Sicilians as like Mexicans, um, uh, olive complexion in many cases, uh, dark brown eyes, dark hair, and that would be kind of the look. 
so to have blonde and fair skinned and all that sort of thing uh, playing uh, Sicilians, it just wouldn't have quite felt quite right. And, uh, and Coppola knew that. And, and so he didn't want to have uh, blonde, blue eyed Italians and Sicilians and so on anymore then uh, a lot of people would think that that would be the, the, right, the right look for uh, uh, Mexican uh, gang members or Mexican drug dealers or something like that. It just wouldn't, it just wouldn't feel right. So uh, the movie won the Best Picture Oscar when it came out. Um, it only won three Oscars uh, that year, surprisingly. Uh, it was a big year for movies, a lot of fantastic movies coming out. The movie that did most of the winning, most of, won most of the Oscars back then, was Cabaret. And Cabaret, and it holds up quite well, it's still a very good movie. It uh, is about the rise of uh, the Nazis in, uh, in Germany in the 1930s. So it seems like it's pretty important stuff, really, compared to a gangster movie. And that's the movie that won the Best Director, uh, and, uh, and editing, and cinematography, and a whole bunch of the other awards. Uh, but at the end of the evening, The Godfather took the final big prize for the best picture. Two years later, when Godfather II came out, uh, it really swept all the Oscars and, and uh, some other really good movies. I remember, there are some really good movies that came out these years, especially Chinatown, which we're going to talk about next. Um, lost all. It was nominated for 10, I think, 10 Oscars, and it only won one. And that's because it had uh, the big 800-pound uh, godfather coming in and really sweeping the Oscars that year. Uh, the uh, original, the opening scene uh, that we're going to look at um, was, uh, let me see it. Let's see what we have here. Uh, there we go, yeah. Um, really light and dark. Uh, there's a wedding going on in the backyard, and uh, Vito Corleone is in his office doing some mafia business uh, in between going out and dancing and being part of the wedding. And there's a tradition uh, at, in Sicilian weddings that the father of the bride grants favors uh, that are uh, or requests. And so... Uh, Vito Corleone is in a position to grant very special and interesting favors like uh, beating people up and buying off judges and things like that. So there are a number of people seeking favors from uh, Vito Corleone. And so uh, his office is lit very dark. There he is in his tuxedo from that opening scene in the movie. The, the shutters are pretty closed and the lighting is from almost directly overhead. So his eyes are really dark, and that's on purpose. That's the way he looks kind of in the movie, uh, almost like sunglasses or something. Uh, you can hardly see his eyes, very dark and mysterious, and people are coming in and asking uh, favors for him. We don't see him for a couple of minutes as a uh, uh, man is asking for uh, his favor and describing what's going on and his daughter and her uh ill treatment and being beaten up by some young men and he wants uh, Vito Corleone to kill the people that uh, disfigured his daughter and he says that's not that's not justice your daughter's still alive it's a wonderful scene and we don't see Brando for a couple of minutes and and it's a nice way of Coppola sort of giving us this sort of delayed gratification like like wait just hold on a little bit hold on Brando's coming, he'll be there, hold on, and when we finally see Brando, we're kind of kind of really ready in anticipation. Outside, uh, there are little bits of darkness coming through. There are some FBI agents in the parking lot, parking area, it's not parking lot, in the parking area, taking down license plate numbers. And, uh, and Vito's oldest son, Sonny, is out there uh, really kind of wanting to pick a fight and the, the damn FBI don't respect nothing and things like that. So that's going on out there. Uh, another uh, part of it is that there is a surprise guest to the wedding, the very famous Johnny Fontaine. And 
Johnny Fontaine is kind of a Frank Sinatra stand-in. Frank Sinatra is from New Jersey, Italian uh, background. He did have some contacts with some mafia types, uh, sort of helping him with his career and things like that. Frank uh, didn't do those sorts of things, but just being friendly with New Jersey uh, mobsters was, um, it was well known, but uh, not a real good look, certainly, for uh, Sinatra. And so uh, thinly veiled account Johnny Fontaine is going to come to The Godfather, come to the wedding, sing uh, for um, uh, Vito's daughter, Connie, and then also ask for a favor. And he wants to star in a movie, and the producer of the movie uh, wants no part of him. He has uh, shown a great amount of disrespect to the producer in the past, and he is looking for a favor. Uh, you'll hear a catchphrase uh, running through the movie, and people back in the 1970s were talking about, make him an offer he can't refuse. And so we will hear a little bit of that. Uh, through Michael and his Michael and his girlfriend, um, played by Diane Keaton, and they are there at the wedding. Michael is supposed to be the son that isn't going to be part of the family business. He's the good guy. And when World War II started, the uh, Corleones, they figured that's not our problem. They have their own world. Uh, we, we don't worry about, uh, you know, if they are Americans or in Italy, if they're fascists. Uh, we have our own world and uh, we have our own laws and all that sort of thing. And they told Michael they could keep him out. They knew enough judges and, um, and, and so on, politicians, that they could keep him out. But Michael is headstrong. He goes, he joins on the day after December 7th. 1941, and comes back from the war in full uniform, from fighting in the Pacific, uh, kind of a hero. Um, his brothers are, are kind of making fun of him a little bit. And he is the son that is supposed to go legitimate, but he's going to get pulled in to the family business. Uh, in the meantime, he's going to tell this uh, rather gruesome story to his date. He's not even married yet. To his date... Um, about how Vito and one of his big henchmen put a gun to a band leader's head and said, either your brains or your signature will be on this contract. And that's how Johnny Fontaine uh, got out of one of his, uh, got out of one of his uh, contracts. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I... Uh, he, he says, that's my family, K, that's not me, but otherwise I can't figure out why would he be telling that story? Why, why would you tell that, that awful, gruesome story? It's really, uh, it's really pretty strong stuff. Uh, and I think that's because he's kind of, kind of proud, right? I think he's a little bit proud that, yeah, he knows Johnny Fontaine. Johnny Fontaine owes his father and and so on. So uh, yeah, he says that's my family. That's not me. But it really, it it really kind of is. And there are a couple of famous scenes of, about getting uh, uh, getting Johnny Fontaine uh, uh, in the movie that he wants to be in. And uh, uh, the Godfather's lawyer, personal lawyer, consigliere, is going to fly out to. Hollywood and try to talk some sense into the producer, uh, Waltz, uh, to let his, uh, let his client be in the film. Uh, there's also a wonderful scene toward the end of the film that I've linked to, um, uh, centering around Michael, and Michael is going to settle all the family businesses toward the end. It doesn't really spoil too much. Uh, and it is a wonderful scene of cross-cutting between five different scenes. The main scene is Michael being the godfather for his sister Connie's new child, uh, a boy, but it's played by um, Sofia Coppola as, as an infant, actually. 
And so we're in a big old church. Uh, we hear the priest uh, praying in Latin. We hear the organ playing and a baby will start to cry, which always puts us on edge a little bit, a baby crying. And that's going to be intercut with five hits that Michael is going to put out on heads of other families and people that have done him wrong. And throughout this wonderful cross-cutting, we're going to continue to hear the baby crying. We're going to continue to hear the priest in Latin and all that. And we're going to see men mirroring some of the actions that are going on at the church uh, uh, with, uh, with holy water and the chalice and all that. We're going to see mirrored movements only this time. It is almost ceremonial killings of putting guns together, putting bullets in guns and things like that, um, mirroring the ceremony of the baptism and the ceremony, uh, the ceremonial uh, or almost ritualistic killings of these five, these five uh, heads of other families and things. A wonderful scene. It really is nice. You might want to watch it a couple of times. There's so much going on uh, in, that, in that scene. So Coppola's the rest of his decade, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good decade. Let me see what else is here. What do we have? Oh yeah, and Apocalypse Now. So, 1974, Coppola had a film, The Conversation, and The Godfather Part Two that were both nominated for Best Picture. That doesn't happen very often, maybe two or three times in history. Some people think that maybe that might cancel out and another film might win, but Coppola did win for The Godfather Part Two. It won the Best Picture. Uh, De Niro won for Supporting Actor and a bunch of other awards and so on. It really swept the Oscars that year. Um, uh, yeah, Director and Godfather G2, Godfather Part Two uh, won. And then in 1979, he had Apocalypse Now, which we will see and talk about when we get up to Vietnam War films. We've got a section on Vietnam War films. So between 1972 and 1979, uh, in that seven-year period, two Godfather movies, a conversation, Apocalypse Now, and that's a pretty darn good decade for any director. That's like a career right there. Uh, and uh, Coppola uh, really uh, ended the decade uh, pretty much on top, that's for sure. So 1974, tough year to have a film out. Unfortunately, that's when Chinatown came out directed by Roman Polanski, who had done Rosemary's Baby, a big hit from 1968. And uh, so this is his uh, follow-up film to that. Jack Nicholson, who was off to a pretty good start in the 1970s uh, after Easy Rider from 1969, and he did five easy pieces and a couple of other smaller films. Uh, he has Chinatown. Um, he had The Last Detail, also an Academy Award-nominated uh, film. And he's going to uh, pick up uh, his coveted Best Actor Oscar for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit as well. Faye Dunaway is uh, the femme fatale. And she's uh, Bonnie and Clyde as Bonnie. Uh, she's got Chinatown, and she's also in Network, and we will talk about Network, too. So, uh, set in the 1930s, it uh, talks about L.A.'s history of water, and some people are, they know that water's going to come through, they know that some land is uh, uh, going to become very good farmland once the water comes through in the San Fernando Valley and so on. Based kind of on uh, LA actual history, uh, here the water's coming through in the 1930s, actually uh, the California aqueduct uh, coming through from uh, the Owens River uh, Valley was um, in the 1910s, I believe, so a little bit earlier. But uh, it is it revolves around a sort of inside knowledge that if you know that this rather arid, almost worthless land is going to become uh, very fertile, then 
the bad guys are going to want to buy up as much of this land as they can so that uh, when the water comes through, it'll be worth a lot more money and they can sell it and make a, make a ton of money. That plot is the same plot as some Westerns. Uh, there's uh, um, Once Upon a Time in the West, and there is, I think, Destry Rides Again. There are a couple of movies that revolve around that, only in the Westerns. It is the railroad coming through, and if you have land near a future uh, railroad station, that will be more valuable. And believe it or not, later on, when we get to Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it has that same plot, only this time the freeway is coming through Toontown, and people who have land there are going to be, sell it, be able to sell it back uh, to the government for a lot of money as well. So it's kind of got this odd, uh, this odd plot that has been used a number of times. It's been used a number of times uh, and even uh, revolving around oil and other things like that. So um, there's a key scene. It, it, it's toward the end of the movie. Uh, it's a wonderful scene, but it does spoil some stuff. So you might, uh, if, you, if you're going to watch the movie and you don't want any spoilers, you might skip uh, the one on Sister Daughter. Um, otherwise, uh, you can, that's one of the best scenes between Nicholson and Dunaway. This movie is definitely neo-noir, new noir. Main film noir era was the 40s and 50s, 1940s, 1950s. Um, and after that, movies that are kind of like that aren't often called film noir. They're usually called neo-noir. I guess film noir needs to be of this very specific uh, period. Uh, and also key, all three of these are in italics, which means they're kind of important. The futility of good intentions. Uh, the, uh, the author, uh, Robert Town, has talked about that. Um, and you think you're doing the right thing, and maybe it's not the right thing. And uh, Nicholson's character is asked to find someone. Um, and now, is that a good thing to find them or not? Maybe they don't want to be found. Maybe they're hiding from someone. Okay, he thinks he's doing the right thing by trying to track down this person. Um, and he has all the good intentions in the world, but it's really maybe not the right thing to do. And so sometimes uh, you do have the futility of good intentions. Um, and you think, uh, really, you think you're doing the right thing and, you know, and, and maybe you're not. Who are you helping? Are you helping the good guy or the bad guy? Also, moral ambiguity a definite part of film noir. We talked about that when we talked about film noir back in our first class. Uh, like I say, it's hard to tell who the good guys and the bad guys are. Our uh, protagonist, played by Jack Nicholson, um, is a detective, but he's kind of a sleazy detective. Most of his work revolves around divorce cases, and that means a lot of his work is spying on people who are uh, sleeping around on their uh, partners, their husbands or their wives, right? So getting telephototype lenses, poking, you know, peeking in through windows and things like that, and getting evidence so that when uh, the divorce comes or when the divorce is uh, on trial, he's got that evidence. It's not really uh, a, a, a noble calling to do that sort of thing. People are willing to pay for it, and it, it makes him a pretty good living, but he's not the uh, classic 1930s detective solving, you know, the murders and all that, at least not at the very beginning. Of course, he is going to get into this rather important uh, plot about L.A. water and, uh, and, and murder and all the whole rest of it, but at the beginning of the movie, he's very definitely not a uh, uh, not a heroic type of a detective, that's for sure. Lots of moral ambiguity floating through. Uh, film schools still teach the script by Robert Town. It is a wonderful script and all the different acts, the first act and second act and the third act and so on, and it is the only Oscar that the film won that year. 
Um, and uh, everybody else had to wait. Everybody else got their Oscars later, sooner, later. All the Polanski got one, Nicholson got a couple, Faye Dunaway got one, everybody else, but not that year, not in 1974. Poor Chinatown was up against Godfather Part Two, which really swept the Oscars that year. So that only puts us up to the to the early to the middle 1970s. There's still a lot of really good 1970s movies to go. Uh, we will visit some of those 